you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Oh man, so how is that weather over there in Pennsylvania? Well, it's uh, late February means it's really ugly and we're all uh, eager to get outside for the nice weather. We have cabin fever. It's We're miserable. I was... Uh... So I was, I was in the city centre today, this morning, and the amount of people who it, it's it, the weather it's starting to turn out. Spring is certainly on the end. It, it's um, beginning round again, and people were looking to buy barbecues, and it's like it's not that warm yet, no, really. <laughs> so they're, they're it, over enthusiastic. They really are. They just want to get outside. They need. They, they, they've right. got their outside itch. Once again, just uh, just trying to push them outside. Exactly. Man, so like I said, I I came across your work and your blog. Uh, which I've got the website up on the uh, the page now of SharonAHill.com uh, because of a friend called uh, Kenny Biddle. He, I think, I don't, I'm not sure if he did a piece with you or whether he recorded an interview with a discussion. I mean, how did you guys uh, get together? How did you find each other? Gee, I can't remember. It's been so long now. We're both in, in Pennsylvania. So um, we had some common friends and uh, it just evolved that we had common interests and, and we were able to meet at certain places and, and uh, walk around and, and have talks. And we, we've gone to Gettysburg a couple of times, which oh, wow. is a paranormal hotspot close yeah, so by. It, it, tell me about that. So uh, Gettysburg, that's the, the, the scene of the Great Battle, right? Uh, so so for those people who perhaps who don't know what that is, I mean, what, what would you describe what the Gettysburg is? Uh, it, it's a battlefield during the American Civil War, and it was really a turning point in the war. And the location is in south central Pennsylvania, right? near the border of Maryland and the Union forces and the Confederate forces met sort of accidentally. It wasn't entirely planned, but they clashed and it was huge casualties at this little town, this little farm town. And these big rolling battlefields uh, were just littered with bodies. And uh, it was quite traumatic for the townspeople. It was obviously a turning point in the war. and. Uh, it's an interesting place, both geologically and historically, too, uh, that the battle took place there. And now people go back there and feel that they have these paranormal spiritual experiences in this location because of all the death and, and trauma that went on there. So it is really a mecca for East Coast paranormalists to go there with their ghost meters and to do investigations there and to have conferences. So it's it's. It's a cool place regardless, but it's got paranormal aspects to it, too. So what kind of uh, experiences do people report as occurring there? They get a lot of EVPs. They say they see apparitions. They feel things. They go into the buildings. They feel spirits around. They, they're touched. They hear things. Uh, they just have a general sense of unease. And um, I have never experienced any paranormal activity worth discussing really i uh but if you go to gettysburg and you have this very deep sense of i call it like a sense of place it, there's a a strange feeling to get there because they're there of the battlefield is there's tons of um uh memorials there all over there's hundreds of memor memorial statues erected and plaques that show some authentic pictures of the the time of the battle so you actually see these dead people were lying right here where i'm standing and you get that very eerie sense that uh you know history may still be there in the in the in the cracks of the rock and in the corners of the building and you just feel it just feels very strange to be in a place like that so i think people feed off that experience and that sense of place and the, uh, some people say the same thing about auschwitz um right uh, there is a it, it has its place in history that should not be forgot uh, what it represents and what what occurred there. So, do you think that's the that's the same kind of resonance that is happening there? That they they feel the sense of so this is a really important place for when things turned and changed that should has a lot of memory, a lot of death, a lot of a lot of life and a lot of story character um, that has been sadly lost uh, for various reasons. Right, and, right. That, that, and, that... and people want to connect back to that history. They yeah. want to go back there and feel what it was like to to find a way to experience it. And sometimes they do that through these paranormal interactions. Yeah, because I kind of wonder, is, is there paranormal groups? And I've, I've seen this a few times. They almost become like um, hobby groups that will go and experience these things. And they actually get their support from each other. It almost becomes a almost a therapy um, to, to do that. Yeah. And I, I found that in a few groups that I've been involved with and ones that I, I communicate with. They, they, they're made of a very, I hate to use the word eclectic people, some people who've had um, trauma or they're looking for answers and they, they come together and have a common bond and it almost appears that they're having a, a social group that has a common interest and that will be their weekly meeting and they'll go and 
do a ghost hunt or they'll go to a graveyard somewhere and uh, yeah. there's a lot of um I think there's a psychological feeling of wanting to just come together just to have the discussion perhaps with like-minded people um is, do you find that's the same uh you can absolutely yourself? yeah absolutely it happens with uh people who have those common beliefs not only in ghosts but also you you ufo ufologists do this uh cryptozoologists do this the bigfoot hunters do this they get to go out in the field and have a day out in the woods and and or uh, spend a night out there looking for something and it makes them feel uh important it makes them feel special that they're part of something special and uh, i wrote pretty much a whole book on how these paranormal groups uh are important in society and you know, they, they may not actually be getting ac good evidence that showing that Bigfoot is real or that ghosts are, 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 are any better evidence that we have over these decades of trying to look for these things. But they do serve a purpose in society, not only to each other, but to the greater society, because people have experiences. They have weird experiences and they have to tell somebody about it. That's right. Yeah. And so you have this community that's formed, whether either you're going to be part of this group. Uh, and, and and go to these investigations and, and research this subject, or you're just a person that has a problem in their house or in their backyard or that they've seen something, had an experience, you have to share it with somebody who understands. And these groups provide that service. They do. Uh, in fact, I was at my workplace a few weeks ago, and there's a lady I met there, she, um, a customer effective issue, and then she started telling me, uh, she says, oh, I've, I've seen you uh, on TV, and... Uh, uh, could could you could you tell me about this experience that I had 13 years ago? Yeah. And it had such a profound experience on this lady that you're going. I don't think I could ever accurately tell you what it is, other than to say I can accept that you're telling me your version of events. I can hear you tell me your story. I can I can hear that it's had a very powerful emotional effect on you. But as to what it is and how it was explained, I cannot do. I, I don't know anything that was happening in in the area at the time. And that's and, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, and that that for a lot of people is a very disappointing to hear but when they talk to people who are you know they're willing to to go all out and believe everything can everyone before the reason kicks in um you find them repeating the story because they get that kind of buzz again and yeah. uh, that's an that's an interesting psychological thing to watch happen in groups or, or when you go to seminars and talks people will often go over the same point it is or they've had just one moment in their life where something similarly unexplained has happened it can be done to sheer coincidence, but the coincidence is not a reason that they want to discuss or think or talk, even talk about. Um, or when you break down, say, the numbers of probability or whatever, they're like, oh, no, 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 this, this has happened. This is because I saw it happen this way. And it, it's fun, but um, it, for some people, I think it's actually, there's a deep psychological damage that's being occurred to them. Yes, yeah. Uh, and that was one thing that I noticed throughout my like pr life journey, I would guess, and in, in how I how I relate to the paranormal. I'm not a paranormal believer, but I'm really interested in these subject areas. And I was disappointed basically in the literature that was out there of the the general public uh, information, the, the popular books and stuff. Just wasn't I mean, it's the same stories being told over and over again. And I was more interested in, in details of people actually investigating. So I did gravitate into the skeptical community and I was a, an active member there for many years. And I don't think that skeptical people who don't believe in, in the paranormal understand that degree of uh, powerful experience that people have these experiences and I can't explain them, but I can't discount their experience and it changed them. Yes, yes it really changed them and that's important what if for whatever caused the experience it's important that they were aff yeah, so affected by I, it i've learned to just i learned to say that i've i acknowledge that they are saying that and for yes. some people i think that's actually just is more than enough for them to go I, i've been believed or I, I've, I i've been able to outlet that story upon to someone and they're willing to listen even if it's just 10 minutes even if they want to have a cup of coffee and tell me their entire story about it and you find that from that, there's often some other threads going on as well um and it's almost like they actually want a counselor who knows about these subjects that perhaps a counselor wouldn't talk about because they're going mm. that that's that's not rationale and sometimes for, for many people that's actually is that all they need yeah yeah they just need to talk they do indeed so um the one of the reasons i i i, can, I, can, I reached out to talk to you is that i i would have said at one time i was a person without reason and uh i you know i i had some beliefs and i, I wouldn't even say they were beliefs they were um, conditioned upon me by the community of expectations that I thought were occurring. 
And it wasn't until I started going, well, let's, how do we verify this? How do we check this? And then you realize that it kind of starts to come apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the point where you start going, okay, so what have we verified here? What have we checked? We've gone to the, this particular location. It has a really interesting story here. But what are we adding to the conversation? What are we providing new other than this location that's been visited by a thousand different organizations and groups and psychics and mediums, etc.? What are we actually doing different? Are we recording anything different? Are we... What, what are we adding are we adding any value to this and as i started to ask the members of our group that can kind of, those kind of questions and okay uh, can we forward this is there an organization that actually is vetting this is there is there any people out there or any groups or societies who are actually benefiting from this information can we forward it to a university whatever um th those things become very closed off and the conversation suddenly changed to me and I, I don't want to discuss them things i just want to have my mm -hmm. little group i mean uh, did you find that with the, some of the people you spoke to as well Absolutely. It, there, There is going to be a number of people who do, well, to, to start, people are involved in, in the paranormal or these groups for an enormous variety of reasons. Many times they've had their own experiences, but sometimes they're just interested in it. And um, some of them are there just to reinforce that belief. And others are there because they want to know what's going on. And so they have a more critical take on it and they start asking the questions and they do evolve in their learning and their understanding. The people who just want to believe are there for a different reason and they're just going to keep reinforcing that belief and they don't want to be challenged. So I did find when I was researching uh, the, the, the variety and the number of groups here in the United States that do these paranormal amateur investigation that uh, often they they don't want to be challenged and they don't want anybody who's critical of them or asking questions at all because they're their own little group. They're their own little set. They kind of have their own rules. And while they pick and choose from the media and other groups what they want to incorporate in their process, they don't want anybody telling them that they're doing anything wrong. Um, and I think that's one of the, the, the things that gets people into these groups because there's there's no barrier. You, if, if you're interested, you can join. You don't have to have any qualifications. You don't have to have a scientific degree. You could just go there because you're interested and just help out. And again, that's that's an important part of our culture. These groups are, there's thousands of them. There really is. Around, I, yeah. I You mentioned something there quite interesting about like you don't have to have any qualifications or any knowledge going into this. You can just join a group ad hoc as it were, and you can come in with your preset of beliefs and your ads to the, the, the melting pot. And um, I guess the idea of not being challenged, you know what, what comes to mind there is like the uh, the growing number of Flat Earth Society believers, and now that, how that's changed quite a bit. Uh, and that's getting a lot of traction. And to watch that, I'd say on the words of social media, develop, and I, I just saw like on Netflix this morning, there's there's, 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 a, there's a movie like special on there. Of, and it's like, what is going on? Yeah. That's these things are complicated. Cultural things are complicated. I think the flat earth idea really feeds on the, the idea of anti-authority. Yeah. We don't need authority. To, we don't trust authority, the government, scientists, whoever. And that does also come into play in other similar paranormal themes where the scientists aren't listening to us. We have to go out and do this. We have to prove, we for example, prove we have to prove Bigfoot there. exists. We have to do it. We're going to be the ones to do it. They all feel that way. Um, they don't really understand that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, one group doesn't prove it. One photo, one video can't do it. You need to have a collective uh, consensus and understanding to move forward. And, you know, that's what I found, that they, they these groups, these investigators pretended to do science. They they did yeah, sciencey things. Sciencey things, that's right. Not yeah. quite science, but sciencey sounding words. <laughs> exactly. But they miss the core of science, which is, you know, a bigger consensus. It's It's testing, it's developing your theories and testing them and, and, and trying different hypotheses and working things out and, and getting everybody on the same page and coming to an idea of what's actually going on there. Yeah, because I, I do think with some things, there appears to be something that's actually going on and maybe there is enough anecdotal efforts to say that something strange is happening in this particular area. Maybe Let's take all, a look. Yeah. Maybe we should go and find out and see if there actually is anything. And I think um, when you realize potentially there's not nothing happening there, maybe, and then you, you, you kind of want to reinforce the belief that something is, and you, you, there's that feeding of that. But uh, I think the thing, the Bigfoot Hunters, is quite an interesting one. I guess in the UK, we don't really have Bigfoot around. Uh, there was a monkey back in the 70s that got escaped okay. from a zoo, and they lived life on the canals for a little bit, which people thought was some kind of Bigfoot character, but um, that, that's a story in itself. But I guess in America, you have, the Bigfoot is, is a really powerful part of your 
um, culture now, really. Um, it is. The, the, the part of like the, as the American as the Northwest, uh, w- it's relatively unexplored forestry area, which I guess if there is some kind of uh, you know upright ape primal might actually exist potentially, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't think there's enough that says it that it does exist. But uh, some of the uh, reports are interesting. But when you've got bears walking around that are, are, are appropriately the same size, and uh, you have large wolves, big cats walking around, anything that kind of has an interesting sound uh, can mm-hmm. instantly be attributed to like a bigfoot-like character or a cryptid of some kind. But uh, I was on a, a radio show in 2008 uh, as a guest, actually, um, for White Noise Paranormal Radio, and there was a cryptozoologist who was the other guest on the show. And uh, he said something really interesting that's always resonated with me. Uh, he says, most people have never even seen a badger. Or a deer. How, how can they even identify something they've never seen before if they've never seen something that's actually a really common animal? Yeah, I think that in the U.S., uh, a lot of us, especially us living on the East Coast where it's more densely populated, we've lost touch with nature. We don't know what nature is anymore. You know, nature is something we have to travel to see. And uh, there was a recent story, probably about a year or two ago, where people in New York City mis- mistook a raccoon for a tiger. <laughs> How could you do that? That's so, pretty different. That's really different. So I I enjoy seeing the news stories of weird animals that people spot, you know, even roadkill or wash up on the shore. And they never seem to ask experts what they are. They just assume they're a mutant, an alien, a hybrid, a monster. Oh, yeah, the, like, the monster, it's, monster and stuff, yeah. It, yeah. It's just a dead animal that's been exposed to the elements and is, is you know, decomposing. Lost, yeah, it's and people fur, yeah. have no idea what that is. That, that's, a, that's an interesting point, is that people don't see death like that anymore. No, we don't see death exactly. decomposing. That happens... In, in the back of hospitals and, and morgues and so on, right. um, and mortuaries. That's a, it's true. We don't see our dead do that, or any anybody animals. But so and if you're out, yeah, if you're out in nature and you're not used to it, yeah, and you hear noises and you see things that you know shadows or, or you know just things that go by you don't recognize. It's unnerving. And our culture does teach us that there are weird things out in the woods. And right now, the culture is very heavy on Bigfoot is out there. Really, we're you know we're trying to convince you it's it's out there, and that really plays into what people's interpretation of of what they see. Yeah, well, I I was also thinking there about um, you know where pareidolia comes into an apophenia, where you recognize uh, features and faces and shapes and body shapes that uh, will throw you off and and it'll make you think you're seeing something. When you're out in the woods with very little light, everything casts a really unique shadow. If you're not used to it, yeah. uh, trees will just uh, look like characters and figures with long, spindly fingers and so on. I just, where I live, I so said my bedroom is kind of in the room opposite from here, and I, I walk through my bathroom, and every night I walk past my coats that are hanging in the co- corridor, and every time it gets me, every time, <laughs> <laughs> there's someone there, no, it's my coat. And, and as much as I know it's my coat, it gets me, but there's someone sure. there. Yeah, right. So when you... I was a kid, there was a big tree behind our house. It was like two pine trees together, very tall and narrow. Looked like a Bigfoot walking away. And I, 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 I love that, that image of that way up on the hill. hill. Um, I, I knew, knew that, that it wasn't a Bigfoot. I knew it was a tree, but it just reminded me of it every single time I saw it. Yeah, I, it, it's great. It really is. Um, when we kind of understand the magic of it as well, that kind of the illusion yeah. that happens. Right. And, yeah, and that's uh, that keeps us... What's the word for it? Keeps us reasoned. We're going, oh, got to yeah. no, 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 no. It doesn't, it doesn't, runs away from us from there. So I'm really interested. Do you, do you have much of a really deep understanding of what the other cryptid cult, cryptids and cryptozoology is happening in the world right now? Because I guess Bigfoot is probably the, the number one alpha one everyone talks about. But of course, there's quite a few, isn't there? There's, there's the various lake monsters. Um, I guess the coelacanth is the one that gets repeated the most often. Yeah, that's, I call that a red herring. I call that the cryptozoological red herring, the coelacanth, because they love to trot that out. They do. It's really not a cryptid. (laughs) I mean, the problem with with some of these fields, especially cryptozoology, is that they haven't defined their terms. And they, they tend to just pick and choose which things reinforce their ideas. And I don't think the coelacanth is a cryptid like... Bigfoot or lake monsters and things like that because it, the way that the the supercamp is explained it's explained as being it was here in the fossil record and then it disappeared for 70 million years we don't know where it's gone now it's back and it appears to be it all appears to be quite um um relevant all around the world it's quite a few different places where it's at 
Um, so it's just that we it wasn't in the fossil record. Well, we found they actually they're, they're deep water fish. You know, they, mm-hmm. they don't tend to come up near the surface, and they appear to have a lot of oil within their body. So they would actually decompose rather quickly in the bottom. So we don't really have much of a uh, um, backlog, as it were, of, the, of their remains to know where they weren't in the in the fossil record. We just know we had one, and then there was nothing after that. Um, but yeah, to throw it straight as like a this is a miracle of cryptozoology. Look what we've discovered is a not really baffle, baffles me every time I hear that thrown that that tr- thrown out there. Uh, actually, there there have been fossil remains from coelacanths from the time where we thought that they were extinct until the present. It's just that they weren't recognized. Yeah. Uh, they weren't identified correctly. Uh, they were shoved in boxes and nobody looked for them because, oh, coelacanths are extinct. This must be something else. I don't have time to identify what it is. So let's put it to the side there. So, uh, And the fact that it, it may have been known to the locals as oh, we get this big you know fish that occasionally we we pull up and we don't like it because it's smelly and it's not good for eating so we we throw it back and um that is an aspect of cryptozoology that's called being ethno known so it's known to the locals and they use that in other um stories as well where there's this animal that people describe that's being there and we can't explain what that is or it doesn't relate to any animals that we know it must be a cryptid well there's a leap that many cryptozoologists make with regards to um the local culture and how they explain things versus how we would try to explain it scientifically and what the local culture may explain especially it's used a lot in in the u.s with uh indigenous people the native americans oh well the natives believe that there was this giant hairy monster man like thing that was part of their culture so that's bigfoot it doesn't work that way it no. could be just a spiritual animal it could be a spiritual creature it could just be an idea you know are we going to believe in fairies and leprechauns and 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 things like that in the woods too they're they're powerful ideas but it doesn't mean that they're actually real things you know when you said fairies i gotta tell you a funny story so there was this so it's about eight years ago right so i'm um i'm at work and doing a tour um in the city center i was i live in, Not- I live in nottingham you see so mm-hmm. I, I used to do a uh, history myths and urban legends tour through the city and i had this lady come over and she was telling me that she has fairies sit on her bike on the way to work so i'm like okay i said I, so I, I wasn't dismissive of what she said um because of course there can be mental issues of what what she is saying so i i, I allowed her to digress what it was she was talking about so she says that she has fairies and they sit on her bike uh on the handlebars when she goes to work and they sit and they sit around her house at home and i'm like okay so what is it you guys talk about and she says we talk about love and light and i'm like is that it? You, what you just say the word love and light? Does, what, so what? So what? What's their society like? Do they have? Uh, do they have a hierarchy system? Do they have a matriarchy system? Is it? Is it a social uh, system? Do they have? Do they have bartering? How, how do they? How do they work with each other? And she goes, no, no, they, 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 they just, um, they make things for each other. And I was like, okay, so it's a bit like a, um, like a, uh, I make you something, you make me something. So do they have a form of currency? Do they have? Uh, what's their? Um, are they interested in higher subjects? Do they have a science division? Do they have a do they have history, history and literature? Do they have a written language? And you can see that these questions are the kind of things that you would talk about if you had being sat on your um, sat on your handlebar about what their life's like and what they do and what they get up to, and what's their beliefs and so on. Um, and it was just so profound to her that someone would ask those quite sensible questions of a lady who says that I, I see fairies everywhere and they they give me joy and they give me comfort and they tell me all love and light and it's like well. Are you sure that if you if they if they are sitting around your bedroom and they're looking at you at night as you're telling me they are, you should ask them what they are actually doing there. And what what do they want from you? Um, and I've kind of always come. I've always kind of used that as a go back to point. So what was it that she was saying that that she would not ask them the questions that she tells mm-hmm. me to talk to all, all the time? So it, was that person ever making it up? Did did she see those things? Is there a mental issue there? Is there a, uh, mix of chemistry going on in the head perhaps isn't the seeing the right thing is she having a hallucinogenic experience um is it a um a schizophrenic experience where they, they see things that are external to the body or is she generally mm-hmm. seeing things that are sat around but if so what are you talking to them about and uh you, you slowly see their 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 fantasy sometimes uh come apart before them and you don't want to cause them damage because it's right. it's i guess it, it's not right for us to do that or anyone but unless someone asks those questions of them, um, that that delusion will hold perhaps for their entire life. 
people are complicated and I, we really underestimate how complicated things are. And can you ever say that you know what it is? Uh, what bugs me is when paranormalists say, I, we've, we've, we've got a ghost. Have you completely gone through every single possibility? No, because we can't possibly know every possibility. And, but yet they say, well, it's paranormal. Yeah. They, they, you, you can't do that. <laughs> No, they haven't ruled out what it can't be. First, is there, is there a yes. light? Is there a light in the room? Is there? Yes, I think, I think there's a, there was a there was a UFO kind of video that's gone viral at the moment. Of uh, it looks like it's shot through the windscreen of a Land Rover. It's the lights yes. on the left hand side of the screen. It looks like it looks like the vehicle's backing up and therefore the light is projecting around. Absolutely. And everyone's yep. going, oh, it, it's it's some kind of fantastic UFO craft. And it's like no, it looks like a light reflection through some water on the uh, on the old dashboard, and the camera looks a bit jerky as it is. Sure. But I was seeing that being repeated in national press, and I'm going, wh where are these journalists coming in with their critical view and their reason pointing? Because I think I should a journalist not be there to go, well, actually, what is it not, and what is it? Before we start jumping, it is a UFO. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, for for seven years, I did the website Doubtful News, and what I did was pull these types of stories from the major media, or or sometimes just reputable people would be telling these stories, and based on what I knew from the history or from my friends who would say, yeah, that's not what they say it is, or we can look at this video and see what it is. I was able to put these stories out on, on my website saying, it's not this, it's probably this, uh, or we don't know what it is, but this, this fact that they're saying is wrong. And what I found that was many of these tabloids, mostly where these things come out, um, but also get picked up by major news sources just for advertising revenue. They just love that people click on them. People are so interested. They want to see what the right. story is about. They want to give their opinion That's on right. what it is, which I, is really uh, interesting. Well, I don't think it's this, it's this. It's no. definitely this. And you guys are all stupid because it's clearly this. And it was a way to participate in this mystery solving they thought that they were doing. But it's really just clickbait. No, <laughs> People just keep clicking it, on the site. It's true. It's and they want to share it, and that's why you find uh, there's a lot of they look like they look like websites, and I think they're computer. Yeah. I think they're AI created or algorithm generated, um, where it's a whole page. They looks like they've snipped literally a sentence from a news source, and it's surrounded by adverts, and that's they're the pages that get shared on social media rather than the actual news source themselves. And sometimes you have that's to right. go. I'm not going to click on ES. Well, this this news source here. I'm gonna to go to the actual news source myself, and um, and it's just awful. And you realize there's actually not much content in within there. And it's like, oh, if you need to find the next picture or the next, then you press press right, and it'll reload a page again full of adverts, and they get click by clickbait from the uh, the impressions being shown. I like you said. I, I think that's how a lot of journalism, a lot of Twitter is these days. It's please come to my site. I, I've got this opinion to say, but I I need you to come to my site so I get paid for my revenue. Rather than yeah, it was news. very frustrating very 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 shallow very shallow mm -hmm. when they literally just will copy and paste one set one paragraph or even just a sentence from somewhere else it's like come on you didn't even uh, you haven't even linked it to where you got the source from it's terrible i used to have people just scrape my entire stories from my site and put them up on their sites yeah sometimes even with my copyright notice at the bottom they just didn't care they just <laughs> printed the whole thing and it was surrounded by ads and they would people would share those stories like you said when I find a story like that, I constantly have to go and click through each one of the links that they have, or I will take the keywords and I will Google the keywords to find all the sources and see how much they match and how much they're just pasted into other places, which it's huge. They just is, I'm not sure that there's much journalism being done at all anymore. This, these are sensational stories. People, they know their people are going to click on them. They just post them without any thought whatsoever. Yeah, and that's why I started the website, but. Yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's a huge loss uh, in critical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, or just like, I think we all like to read something silly um, that's a bit of fun. I fun, in, yeah. in, in you scroll down Facebook or you look down your Twitter feed or you're rolling through your news uh, feeds that are coming through. I mean, it's quite obvious to some uh, that what's an ad and what's a news story. And the news stories, again, are just, they're, they're a clickbait headline. You must click this. This is really interesting. Ten things you can do today. I'll have a look <laughs> at that. And you come away from it going, why did I do that? Yeah. Why did I do that? <laughs> or or you go down the rabbit hole either there or on YouTube because you've clicked on the next <laughs> it's, thing. It's oh, it's terrible. We've all done it. But so what? Why do, don't do we read books anymore? I don't know. I mean, 
I, I wish I, people did read more books. I, I think I've got books. <laughs> but no, so do you think then paranormal like acceptance is a belief that's now a majority? Because uh, I think I, I saw that as a story the other day. It's, it's like I, didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't follow through in data. Um, but paranormal belief is now an accepted majority. Is that is that the, is that across America in general? Yeah, I, I think it's it's across America. It's also uh, a lot of European countries are exhibiting the same. And in fact, uh, this is done by Chapman University. They do a, a poll every year and they ask people about paranormal belief in different subjects. So ghosts, uh, psychics, UFOs, aliens visiting the planet, um, things like that. And it's it's going up. In general, everything is sort of going up. There are some that are more than others. Ancient alien beliefs are huge now. People believe that there are lost continents like Atlantis and, and things like that. Um, clearly, that's a media influence. These TV shows, this, these media products are pushing that agenda. And people are seeing it on TV and saying, oh, there must be something to it. Yeah. Um, but in general, the idea of the enchanted world, the world is more than what we see or the materialistic things that we see, is that belief is growing because maybe people are lacking something. Maybe they're, you know, the Orthodox religion is going down and, and people aren't so much religious anymore, but they're inventing their own ideas of spiritualism. Yeah. And I they're moving into more new age things and things like that. I think there's also another transition that's occurring as well. It's one that's quite prevalent on, on TV and on media is uh superheroes powerful mm -hmm. powerful storytelling medium i think comic books are, tell a, a fantastic story now we've got to the level of technology that you can replicate that on screen and have it look realistic enough that it tricks your mind to think it actually could be real when those superhero shows i know as amazing as some of them are and uh, they all talk about different dimensions and aliens and um you know superpowers that potentially the normal person could have now the lay person could be a superhero um Again, and that's the same kind of belief structure you're you're feeding right. into a lot of people that um, the idea of you know hidden agendas and secret societies and you know government corruption and the police state might be corrupt as well, um, and then you have to be a, you have to be an individual superhero is off and on his own and he's a little bit of a loner and um, doesn't have many friends but the friends are also eclectically a bit weird as well and uh, they can get together to, to fight back the evil enemy. And I think that's that's a powerful narrative in and of itself that is replicated repeatedly. And you look at how, how so I, I choose like I choose well like Disney or whatever Marvel or, and DC are putting out, that is the narrative that most people, teenagers wise, uh, really look up to in the same way that people look at Buffy and uh, people looked at like um, Charmed back in the day where there was a whole like Wiccan phase where everyone became right. a witch and a vampire hunter and stuff. And then everyone's now a superhero. And there's a really interesting like, media narrative about that. Yeah, if if you really look, there's some incredible threads through that uh, where you can find out how it reflects our cultural uh, space and time. You yeah. know, what are we afraid of right now? And what do we need from an alternative view of the world? And those things become popular. I don't know why there were all these ghost shows that came up in the 2000s. It was just an explosion of these oh, TV shows. Some were awful. <laughs> They were terrible. None of them were any good. Right. And uh, then, then there were some even UFO shows. Well, you can't, you can't really get much worse than a UFO TV show because UFOs just make terrible <laughs> TV subjects. They're, they're just not there. I mean, you got to have people looking up at the sky. It's boring. Yeah. Um, but the Bigfoot shows, they they became also extremely popular. And I heard many people tell me, "Well, I don't watch those because I believe in it. I I watch them because they're funny." or we laugh at them, or um, it's it's a joke, and or people did watch them because they eventually picked up a, a belief in them. They said, oh, well, they're really finding evidence there. Really? So there must be something there. So it's kind of interesting. There hasn't been a lot of research on this, of why people watch paranormal-themed TV shows, which which are reality TV shows, not not fiction, yeah. and, and what they get out of them. Do they go there because they have a pre-existing belief? Or do they get a belief because they watch them? There hasn't been much research no, done on really, that. That's a really interesting thought to have, isn't it? Uh, I was going to say, so in the UK, we had a, a quite famous show called Most Haunted. That is, it's still yes. on today, actually. Um, I, I, I kind of watched it. Many, many, many of my friends uh, have worked on that show. And uh, it's interesting to have watched it from an outsider's perspective, how the narrative changed from being a quite an interesting, uh, we're going to go into this location and just do like a general investigation. It kind of set the precedent for TV, how they're presented. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there was a narrative that kind of threaded it, 
thrown into that where it went from being ghosts to being poltergeists to being demonic witches and it suddenly became demons are chasing the main stars and how, how, yeah. do, you, how do you top this for the next show how do you get the person to watch the next show and the next season is going to have a bigger budget so we're going to have a we now have to have a, a threat of a common enemy um is that the same for shows that perhaps you've watched like stateside you know where there has to be if the, the narrative has to involve there has to almost be an arc to keep people gripped to the end of the series as opposed to presenting well actually there's something quite interesting here it's a nice big spooky castle um let's see what there's some history about this place that we can talk about the stories that are here doesn't mean there's anything here but we'll walk around and we'll film it and see what you think i think there's a very different how you present that to being it's demons <laughs> Yeah, uh, the demon thing was was uh, quite shocking, although it, it happened probably it was introduced with the idea of there was a show called Paranormal State, which was a group of college kids that were work actually in Pennsylvania, and they brought in um, the, the person on the show was Catholic. Yeah, so you Ryan. bring in that, that baggage <laughs> that you have of, of religion, and then they would bring in Lorraine Warren as a uh, consultant. And of course, the Warrens saw demons and everything. Demons were everywhere from, and, and they were active in the, the late sixties and into the seventies. And it's amazing that they carried through right today. There was this lull where we were treating uh, parapsychology, paranormal as like parapsychology and something more scientific. And now we're back to all the supernatural aspects of it. I'm not sure why, but yeah, the demons are huge. And even the ideas of, of Satan and and is, is in manifesting in TV shows and media today for kids. So yeah. these things come in waves. It's true. There's, a, there's, a, there's like a rich source of like psychology, uh, psychology and sociology that can be investigated there. As, uh, these no, yeah, one, one thing about Most Haunted, Most Haunted, there's a couple papers analyzing Most Haunted because oh, yeah. it was such a unique show. Oh, I should go and check those out, actually. <laughs> So it's it's a such a powerful um, storytelling medium, I think, because you can you can present a fiction narrative through what appears to be a factual TV show. Uh, oh, a good example of that was Ghost Watch. Ghost Watch, yeah. I mean, Stephen Volk is a as a as a contact have on Facebook and talks to you quite frequently. Uh, he he obviously wrote that show, and uh, he 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 always whenever anyone posts something about it, he always shares it out and goes. Uh, it's interesting the the cultural narrative that that's stuck into that. I can remember yes. watching that live at about. I think I was about 13 years old, and I can remember watching that and going, "Really, that was powerful." Uh, and I didn't quite get it at the time. I don't even think I actually watched the ending when the show originally aired. It wasn't until I watched it later on, and how it was like a huge bust afterwards, and everyone was upset, and some people yeah. thought it was like a live séance happening on TV, and it really pushed a lot of buttons. Um, I can remember the conversations happening, and I was I was only a teenager. I can remember going past up newsstands and start seeing Ghost Watch on there, and uh, how that's changed. Um, yeah. But actually, but actually, it, it found its wealth woven into um, to watching Most Haunted. I found like I was watching that Ghost Watch play out over the course of ten, fifteen seasons. It's it set the template. It really did. Yeah, he did a, an amazing job, and he, he actually yeah, went it's on a great to write, show. Yeah, he went on to write uh, many other things as well. Like, uh, Afterlife, I thought was really good. It was uh, one of his things. And he's got another show coming called Winstable, one of his books. He's uh, that's getting mm. produced into a TV show. But man, so what do you think? Uh, how do how, how do people? change that how do they apply reason perhaps in the most easiest of way what, what do you think so what's the, so the solution for all of these, this kind of like paranormal rhetoric what's the uh, how do people apply reason quickly i don't know i mean th th you're always going to have a portion of the population when we're talking about the, the the percentage of belief there's always been a very high percentage of belief i think it hasn't really gone down um you can always get 20 percent of your respondents to say something completely outrageous in a poll Yes. really extreme uh but for the most part people are like well it might be fun to believe in this or um i do believe in it because i've had an experience uh i don't know that they're too willing to to give that up really or they they want to think about it they you know people like me i try to find out what's really going on here and it seems that that's kind of rare yeah i think yeah most people don't really want to know the details of what's going on they just want to have more fun with it and it serves their personal purpose uh, I, I do think that we're at a really uh, low at critical thinking in society. We're so used to the media feeding us what we need to know today or telling us what to think that we've lost the ability to think for ourselves. Do you think because people have watched the news and watched it now spin as many stories as could possibly be the case? Uh, and everyone is sick of seeing clickbait. Everyone yeah. is seeing, uh, everyone's sick of news that has no substance. So, I mean, obviously in the UK you have like quite um 
what puts itself across as uh, investigative journalism, newspapers like The Guardian and like The Times, etc. But you'll find they, they're the ones who perhaps put the most, I'd hate to use the term fake news, but news that has no substance out. It'll mm-hmm. be like, look at how many balloons we can hold on the side of this. That's not important. Tell me, give yeah. me some news that is something real. And you find, I think, uh, I mean, Joe Rogan was talking about the other day on his podcast, how uh, Twitter is the news now. Um, mm-hmm. So now, and that there's certain journalists who work in certain uh, fields, they only have their their friends or their their news type of network. So they could they say they are only kind of tweeting to each other. So they, it's reinforcing the narrative that that is the news, as opposed to them actually analysing what is the what is the real news, what's really happening out there, what's really happening on the streets of like Newcastle. Is there really uh, why is there such low unemployment, but everyone doesn't have any money? How does that work? Uh, is it zero hour contracts? No one's asking. No one's asking important questions anymore, um, right. because it's as much it's, it's as much fluff in the media as possible to stop people asking questions. I think people are just tired of it that they don't look interact with the news anymore. No, we don't. We don't have a quiet. We're so bombarded with this information all day long, yeah. and it's even sometimes hard to turn it off at night to go to sleep. Uh, do we ever stop and you know have quiet time and think about things or, no. or, or do these deep dives into these questions? Because they're very complicated and they don't have simple answers. It seems like we always want those simple answers. But Ten it takes time to life. think through these things. It's true. I, mean, I, I, was, I joke that I have 10 steps to a new life. Everyone wants the, uh, the quick get how do I get myself fixed uh, routine? Yeah. Uh, or how do I fix society? Oh, this person promises that they can fix things that's with, a, you know, just that's a simple... A, that's just build a wall. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Or that's, just that's, a signature. That's, that's, I'm going to That's a really, that's a really prime example, isn't it? You know, now he's going to follow it's, through with something like that. It, in practical terms, they're very difficult. But in terms of a slogan, amazing. <laughs> yeah, no no context there. No. I mean, it's just like, we're, we're just going to do this. Well, what, what does the data show that, that the actual problem is? How... What will fix the actual problem? Uh, how much money will this cost? Is it worth the money? It, it, there's so much that goes into thinking about these things. Nobody thinks about these problems anymore. Or at no. least we don't see them doing that. No. We see the very shallow answer thrown out. Yeah, it's, I think the social media has changed the way that matters are discussed now. Everyone everyone can put an opinion out there very easily, mm. very quickly. And uh, through the melting pot of the internet, can get even the most silly idea can get shouted up to the top of the pile quite quickly which yeah. then um, it has to be responded to in a way. And often it, it is of so little substance. Unfortunately, there's a lot of voices shouting about it, but it has to be enforced or regulated or put through, often just to shut it up. <laughs> I'm really scared of, uh, with social media these days because it's, it seems to be doing more harm than good. I mean, I know it has great good, it does. where people are able to communicate across the world all these ideas and, and, and reach you know the entire planet with these ideas and, and what's going on. But on the other hand, we're overwhelmed with these horrible voices that are just drowning out any any reason yeah there's a uh, reason is it's the hardest thing to get through to some people i like well, just... and you can't do you can't do it in twitter i mean it's no. this big i mean it's not yeah, that it's much a, room sorry, it's, it's 200 characters these days can you communicate an idea you I, can't i think it's an interesting idea though to put to simplify an idea to 140 or 260 characters mm-hmm. actually it's profoundly psychologically interesting of how you can take a sentence because after that I've wrote something and I've gone, oh, I've got to change that, change this one. How do I keep yeah. the same context but it means the same thing? And uh, you can have fun with that. But I think yeah. when you start, when that's the only way you're communicating to the world, and you know, you've, if you've got teenagers or whatever, you look at their messages, how they talk to each other, and you realize they communicate in one word sentences or words. It's like the language is breaking down because of having to shorten things and make things simple for everyone. And when you realize, let's say, like at university and at colleges, things are. Uh, qualifications are made simpler because there's a low pass rate. I oh, know we've got to let's diversify that. We've, well, let's make the paper slightly simpler. Is therefore mm-hmm. is there is the IQ and the rationale of what they would the end product would be? They're not quite as smart as they should be anymore. But we right. tend to have given them a piece of paper what it says they are, and I think that's a dangerous uh, precedent as well. Right, right. I hope that they're smarter in new ways. I hope that the yes. generation coming up. I mean, I have two kids. Um, they're both, they're not little. I mean, one's 20 and one's, uh, 15. So I see them smart in different ways than me. They're, they don't read books, but they're, they're, they're savvy in other ways that I wasn't. So it's interesting to see that evolution in our culture. It is, it is. If you were a person who saw a ghost or saw a UFO, how do you tell them that's not what it is, but this is what it might be. What's, what's the easiest way to explain that? Do you think? 
I'm not real good at that. Mm -hmm. And people write to me with their stories a lot. And they say, like you said, I'm going to tell you my story. Tell me what happened or what, what do you think it is? I wasn't there. This is your experience. I wasn't there. Um, it went through your lens of exper of, of life experience and, and your perception and I can't possibly comment on it. And I've pulled away from that. I think when I was younger, I tried to try to do that. Oh, it was probably this. It was probably that. And I realized that that was not a good way to do things. And I don't think it helped people to do that. No. And it certainly wasn't correct because I had no idea what it was. So I don't really like people to tell me their stories and then say, well, what do you think it is? I don't even much like anymore when people give me photographs or pieces tell me, of tell evidence me, tell me and say, what, what do you is? think this is? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know because the context is so broad what it could be. Um, I think I, I, you know, people tell me these things and I, I nod and I try to be sympathetic because I realize that it's been a powerful experience for them. And um, I, I'm, I'm still learning to ask those right questions on how to progress the conversation a little bit. Uh, I, I've been through a couple, I think, I, I kind of think of it as like a pendulum and in, in, in the way my belief has swung. I, I was used to be a believer, then I was a very total skeptic, and now the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth, but is slowly settling to the middle where it's like, I'm not sure I'd really, you know, want, want to make a conclusion about it at all. I'm fine with saying, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a, that's a really nice place to put yourself isn't it I, I don't know well, we can talk about it but i have an interest yeah. in it but actually i don't think there's an expert who might who, who can give you the answer that you are, would be satisfied with so that's that's the question that's the answer i put to you is i can't i can't give you an answer can you yeah. can you can you accept i don't know yeah that's, that's interesting, interesting but i don't know that's it yeah. and there was not many people, people are comfortable, comfortable with that though because they, they, they want an answer they want the, the absolute you know this this person this has been holding on to me now for ten years. How do I how do I move on from it? It's, it's one of those things. Sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. So just accept it as your experience and move on. Oh man, so that, actually, there was something I was going to run by you. Actually, uh, there was a news article I think came out yesterday. Um, it was actually about Amelia Earhart, possibly the most mm -hmm. famous uh, female pilot, and she's the most used trope I think for disappearing Absolutely, people. Absolutely. Yes. And I've always seen. I've gone, but I'm sure they actually found her diary like 60 years ago, and they found a, a, a number of objects on an island, and they never found her body, admittedly. And uh, it's come out they've now released. I think it's the, um, the U.S. Um, Aviation Recovery Authority has now I believed to have found her plane. Uh, they've mm -hmm. dived down there. They've seen they found her plane. And uh, but for so many years, this has been used as like she went through the Bermuda Triangle or the Devil's Triangle. She was kidnapped by aliens, and I think that all now disappear. And then I saw a meme this morning that was about how how interesting is it that nobody disappears in the Bermuda Triangle anymore? And I was like, actually, have these things moved on? Uh, so have we have we moved on from Elia Earhart having like alien abduction problems and the Bermuda Triangle no longer being something that sucks and makes ships disappear and stuff? Have, have we now moved on from those um, mysteries that we now? Well, I would, I, yeah, I would hope that maybe people have finally come to the conclusion that, oh, well, maybe there really isn't any, anything going on there. I, I still think they do come in waves. You know why? Why are why is flat Earth coming up again? You know things. <laughs> it's just strange things that that do come in waves because they're they work at the moment, I guess. Uh, not too long ago, they said uh, there was evidence that came out, uh, and it was shown on on a TV show that that Amelia Earhart was captured by the Jap the Japanese, and okay. there was a picture that showed that she had been seen in in off the uh, a, in a harbor in Japan. Okay, that was it was it was a terrible picture. Clearly, wasn't her, and the place and the time was completely wrong. But yet, uh, you know, no work was done to to verify this, and. That's the story that people got that, oh, Amelia Earhart was seen here yeah. and they didn't get the follow up story. I'm hoping that maybe for the Internet uh, age, people are curious about these subjects and actually go online and look and see more of the story than just the believer aspect. Yeah. There's some sometimes like Wikipedia articles are pretty balanced. They are. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know. How, Wikipedia gets a bit of a bad press, really. But. Generally, it's sourced at the bottom. You you don't have to, you can read the person yeah. who's wrote the facts above into a par into a statement or a paragraph, but actually you can go to the bottom and go check out the sources yourself. 
And I would yeah, encourage so if you, yeah, if you're really interested, you can get a fuller story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got, I mean, you've got to compress it. Uh, condense it all yourself to process it as opposed to reading someone else's yeah. work there um so yeah it, it's, it's really interesting the way the internet works the, the the hive mind or the fact that you really people these days have access to so much information um that i think that's perhaps where it goes wrong we're so bombarded with so much information i don't think our, our human minds can comprehend how much we've actually got in, in a palm of our hand in our phone or when we got uh right. pcs and everything around there's so much information being thrown our way but I think it's overwhelming for many people. I think people now have more anxiety about what they're going to read on the news or what in their phone than at any time in history because you have everything. Yeah. I agree. I know I do. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I constantly I'm, I can't keep up. I can't keep up. Even for like if I pick one topic, I feel that I can't possibly get everything on that topic uh, and 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 analyze it and digest it to the point where I could tell you that I'm some kind of expert. I never feel that way. No. I feel that there's always too much out there that I haven't yet explored or haven't read or haven't thought about. It's it's true, it really is. There's so much out there that uh, it's just almost too much for everybody. And... Do, do you ever see that like the Dunning that um, Dunning Kruger curve oh, about knowledge and confidence? So when you first find out about something and you do like a quick search on it and you know maybe you just Google it and all of a sudden your knowledge your thinking of knowledge is is uh, it goes way up you're confident that you know so much about the subject okay. and then you start reading more and more about it and your confidence and understanding starts to trend downward downward until you get to a point where you're like i am never going to understand this at all <laughs> and your confidence in in what you know is lost because you realize that it's so much bigger than you first suspected no that's 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 a really interesting uh, observation that's been made um, and I guess perhaps we've all perhaps been guilty of uh, at some point where we've gone, okay, I'm going to go find this out. Because uh, isn't it like um, Socrates, at what if we wrote everything down, we would not be committing as much to memory anymore. So the fact that we can, we say that we're knowledgeable, we know some and stuff, is that because we know we can go and Google and find the answer, mm -hmm. even though we actually don't know it ourselves? So it's not even written That's down a, anymore. It's in, it's in the ether. <laughs> it's a skill. Yeah, you know that you know how to, you know where to go to find information, and I think that teaching kids these days how to sort through all this information is a skill that maybe we didn't need when we were growing up because there was more of limited uh, yeah. options of sources to use. Now they've got everything, and they need to know how to sort through what's good and bad. Yeah, and there's a lot. There's a lot out there of all sides, and everyone's like everyone's got an opinion everyone's got a voice everyone's got their their view on how it is and everyone can now self-publish everyone can write a blog everyone can write and you're just yeah. like damn how do i find an actual story and nugget in there even if i just wanted to search and just discuss i don't know uh roswell for instance no don't, i'm not even gonna oh my gosh not even gonna, not wouldn't even try wouldn't even try <laughs> and, and the day today you can self-publish your own book yeah like like that and I've gone through a couple, uh, to go back to the paranormal theme, paranormal self-published books. They're so awful. They're just waste of paper, so many of them. Uh, it's rare that I find one that's actually worth reading, but yet these books get passed along to each other. Said, so, well, I'm an expert. I wrote a book. Yeah. Well, you know, my book took seven years to write. <laughs> you know, it's, it takes a very, very long time to do good work. It does, but it's yeah. so easy to do bad work. You could just throw it out there, and people throw out these books several a year, and they're just not all that good. No, and, there's, uh, and what's inside them? It's just was it like you said? It, it wasn't worth the paper it was printed on if it, if you got a printed version at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen. I've never. I've never actually owned a really bad paranormal book, so I guess I've always picked and choose the ones I've bought. Um, That's good. I have done for I have done for a long time. I, I guess I I know the people. I I will literally go and approach them directly and go. Why why would why would I want to buy your book? Tell me about what's inside. What what's the worth of it? And you when you have that conversation, you go. Maybe I'll leave, leave that, put that one to the side, but I'll, I'll buy this one instead. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with a a good book out there. And there is there's plenty of books on the panel that are actually really good or, or resource mm -hmm. articles and uh, magazines and so on. I've had quite a Absolutely. few. I've had quite a few articles myself published in Paranormal magazine and Supernatural magazine, but um. Yeah, there's there's so much so much to get through, and I think for, for people jumping on board, 
how you've just watched your first sightings program or you've just started watching Beyond Belief or you listened to Coast to Coast for the first time, for many people, what, what, where do they start? You know, mm -hmm. would, but would their recommendation would be to go to SharonAHill.com instead? <laughs> um, I've actually stopped blogging a little bit because yeah. I had that feeling that I didn't know enough to say anything original or uh, useful. And that that's my own hang up because I probably could do it. It just uh, it, it didn't occur to me that I, I thought that was useful. But oh, man. Um, I there's so high many... five. That's my problem. <laughs> that's, that's the same position <laughs> there's, I'm there's... in. I don't want to write about it because I don't think I'm adding anything new to the conversation. Yeah. It, 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 like I said, it does take a lot of work to contribute something original. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of these websites are just rehashing the same old stuff. And it's frustrating because you see the errors propagated as well. Uh, yes, you do. And blogs are kind of dying now. I'm not getting as much um, traffic. Pe people in general are not getting as much traffic to their blogs and certainly mine. And uh, when you put yourself out there, you get a lot of criticism. Too. It's very easy to sit there and criticize uh, people if you're, you know, your armchair critics, but come come out come after you for sometimes really silly things. So it is hard. It is hard to put yourself out there these days uh, as as a blog. Uh, and I'm I'm struggling right now. Do I want to write another book? I'm writing, uh, you know, a couple pieces for Forty in Times because I think that's a that's, good that's a good great, way to get great magazine. Yeah, I I love that magazine and. At a certain point, I didn't think I, I belonged there because I was so involved in, in the skeptic community that they didn't see me as as someone to listen to because they thought they assumed that I was just the the, the naysayer skeptic, you know, the dismissive skeptic. No, actually, I, I, I find that they, they do a really good job of uh, making sure everything's verified, everything's sourced. And, absolutely. You know... And and it is not a joke publication and there are good researched articles in there and i just enjoy going through the pages i read the whole thing cover to cover because yeah, i like the i like the weird news and i like the features and i like yeah. the book reviews and Absolutely. movie reviews and so i guess when i sent you peter law's uh, view you were like oh i know him <laughs> <laughs> it was funny he did tweet something one time because his his piece had come out in 14 times and mine had also been in the same issue ah. i did a review of uh uh, Zach Baggins, uh, Demon House documentary, and uh, I got I got a little bit of bad feedback from that too. There was one nasty letter to the editor about that. All right. Uh, I was I didn't like the documentary because I thought it was terrible and it was over dramatic and it was kind of ridiculous and I couldn't follow it. But most the biggest problem I had with it is he never let anybody else at this haunted location. He closed it off and then he destroyed the house. Well, if you're really interested in paranormal research, why wouldn't you invite other people in to investigate and and think about this problem? You've got it. You've got this example. Why wouldn't you like to share it with people? No, he just wanted it for himself and he destroyed it. So that was my play on the article was that I was mad. I don't know if anything really did happen in this house or not. I suspect that it didn't. But why wouldn't you open that up to the bigger community? Instead, you know, Baggins is a paranormal celebrity and he just feels like he's just in it for himself. And the feedback I got from the article was by one person who said that I was elitist and that, um, you know, these amateur paranormalists are doing more than scientists are doing to discover secrets of the paranormal. And I just sat there scratching my head going, he didn't add anything to it. I don't know what I don't know what this is all about because I don't see the amateurs adding a whole lot no. to the science of it at all. No, no. Um, I, I, I do think for a lot of people it's just a case of you can get together with your mates, you can go to a spooky house, or you can go on an organized ghost hunt at somewhere that's, well, wherever. Um, and you just get to, you get to talk about your experiences, you get to have a laugh, you get to have a drink, and you get a bit of a socialize, and then you go home afterwards having walked around feeling like you've discovered something, but actually yeah. you didn't. Yeah. Really. The, you know, there are a few of these paranormal celebrities who love to visit universities or colleges. They get, they get invited by clubs to do lectures, not by real professors, but by clubs to come in and do lectures. And they'll make a big deal about the fact that they have appeared at a university or they're teaching a class or something like that. And it's just sort of a, uh, it's cheating <laughs> the authority. You're, you're not 
<laughs> you're not really a professor. You're just there to give a talk. And um, they, they just enjoy that sense of authority that they have. And the media also treats them like experts. Yeah. And they, they, they get a buzz off that. Well, it's, it's like, a, look at my authorityism. Like, I, I've, been, I've been granted this position here at the university because I, am, I clearly am the expert that everyone needs to know. It's, <laughs> That's right. It's like, no, you, I'm, you, I, if I'm skeptical of anything, it's experts, expertise. I, I think expert is a dangerous word to use. It um, is. It really is. Uh, in in any, any context. So, like, you know, we, we've actually been talking quite comfortably for an hour now, you know. Man, so I, I've really enjoyed this conversation here, Sharon. And, uh, you know, I'd like to do it again sometime, actually. If, uh, okay. if you're more than willing to, because uh, I guess we, we've kind of we've kind of cut across I guess, a whole broad section, everything from cryptozoology to uh, the, the the sociological and the psychological background, even um, geography, which I, I maybe that's something actually we should tap a little bit, uh, into a little bit before we go off. Is that how much do you think um, geography and in geology of an area uh, plays into um, the beliefs of people? So I don't know if you were, if you there's that place, I think it actually is in Pennsylvania, it's like the huge giant snake uh, mound. Is that Pennsylvania? I think It's oh, Ohio. Oh, Ohio. Yep. So a lot of people, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of people uh, ascribe that to be an ancient aliens and so on. So um, when potentially it was built just because it looks like a snake. Yeah. Could be an art, yeah. Art, big art project. Um, it, it has a lot, to, I think it, it does play a lot to do with it. Uh, geology, and I started looking at this because I did see some common themes showing up in especially things like mysterious places this place is spiritual or special uh oh, let's right. use the example of devil's tower in wyoming uh oh, it was the it it was a key symbol of close encounters of the third kind the movie uh, of course of course yeah it's kind of yeah. Me now, yes uh and and that is a real place and it's a bizarre formation and it just stands out and you can't be there i haven't visited it but you can't look at it and say it's it's not a powerful thing it's not an incredible natural phenomenon that affects people and say how did this possibly occur and um i started thinking about that and really it's all geological i mean it's, it's a completely natural geologic phenomenon it had nothing to do with people but people imposed their beliefs and their reactions uh, on it and, and took away from it. And I found that fascinating. So I started looking into places that were other places that had a devil name to them and found that they were all geologically interesting. Okay. Um, what, what really got me into things, uh, into this subject area was the idea of the stone tape where the geology somehow records an emotional event and then that gets played back as a ghost yeah it's quite Something a fascinating like concept isn't it that somehow the natural environment would somehow record uh emotions or of an event that somehow if the i don't know if if the sun rises at the right time and the moon's in the right place and it's rained okay uh somehow <laughs> it will trigger the recording to replay yes i think it in itself it's quite a fascinating just jump of logic and belief in there um, I like, I guess, when we're talking about Gettysburg earlier, uh, some places really do hold some kind of solemn feeling because you know it happened there. But mm -hmm. if you were just walking across this field and didn't know it was there, would you feel the same way? Well, maybe not because you wouldn't didn't know. Uh, it's only because people are holding a belief that there's something is happening there. Um, and there's quite a few places in, in the UK that are like that too, like Stonehenge and so on. Absolutely, uh, yeah. That people have... Uh, projected that it, it's it's the druids built this or it's it's the the romans built this or the pagans from thousands of years ago or the ancient aliens built it giants from the wales built this uh they project that what it is it's going to be there it's certainly not certainly these weren't natural and they will put up and it, it does stand the test of time it does look pretty miraculous but yeah um who knows what it was what what, what their intention was behind building it whether it was built yeah. in four days or 20 years or who knows? Right, right. Uh, one of the subjects I, I researched extensively was ley lines, which yeah. began, the idea began in, in, in the UK and in, in Britain. And a fascinating subject of, of what it started out being and then what it turned into. <laughs> it looks, it looks like, that's an interesting thing. Cause it looks like the author itself didn't know what himself, what he discovered. He, yes. well, in, in, in like the old dirt tracks, it's like, well, I found there's a number of uh, churches that appear to line up correctly across the geographical lines of the, of the country. And then he started mapping them even further. And he himself was a bit like, I don't know why this is the case, because it goes across rivers, it goes across bogs. There's no practical reason why these should be in a straight line. And I don't really know. And I, and it, cause I, have, I, have one, I think I have the first book of that, 
I, I know we did a second one, but it looked like he never projected what it was, other than going, it's really interesting that these are, ha are occurring. And there's a whole belief that these en they're energy lines and UFOs use them as flight paths. Yes. Like, what the? <laughs> yes. It, it was incredible because many, many years ago, I was at a, a paranormal conference and a ghost uh, uh, investigator found out I was a geologist and said, oh, what do you think about ley lines? And I'm like, I didn't know ley lines had anything to do with the paranormal. He says, oh, yeah, that's 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 what we're, we're looking at, that these are these lines of energy also uh, enhance paranormal energy. And I said, I'm going to go back and look at that. So I, while I was researching it, the last Ghostbusters movie came out with with the all female team, okay. and the premise of that movie was ley lines. Yeah, I didn't. Know and that. I was floored. I didn't know that. I, I, yes. I, I kind of refused to watch the newest one. To say. Yeah. Well, I have I have a post on ley lines, uh, which shows the clip from that movie. Uh, it's it's on my site, Spooky Geology. And when I started that site, I thought, oh, I'm just going to go around and 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 write posts about paranormal aspects of geology and weird weird geology and things like that well i was overwhelmed at the content that was that i could possibly cover and i almost i took a step back from it for a while so i don't know where to even begin on this like we were talking about there was so much to do that i was completely overwhelmed but i'm still thinking about it i'm still i'm still working a little bit on it yeah there's um i can touch, put you in touch with an interesting guy actually um, he writes um, mysterious sites of uh, England and Wales, and I think he's kind of covered that in regards to that. And also, so has oh man, my memory's going. I, I keep I can see these guys in my head. I can't remember the name. It's terrible. Um, and he did uh, some interesting experiments with the um, what's it called the lair caverns. They are um, some they're almost like Stonehenge like um, structures, but they appear to be capped. So like there's like two upright circles, and there's one on top. And they did some interesting dream experiments, like underneath they slept underneath them, um, and what was their what dreams did they have, and some other interesting things like that. And they were they were trying to map the geology of places, and was it having an effect on the biology of people? Um, when I get, when I find that paper, I'll, I'll send it over to you. I think you'd find it really interesting. Um, so I think I think people have sort of gone well. There's these really interesting places, and there's um, natural places such as. Um, um, like Ayers Rock in Australia, that have this profound look that that's got to be the gods must have done something there. Uh, and yes, that, exactly. Because there's no way nat nature could have prepared something of that kind of awesomeness um, for us to see unless it unless God personally intervened and did all this. Um, and there's beautiful stories that surround those places yeah. too from the the, uh, the Aboriginal people, like both at Uluru, which is Ayers yeah, Rock, okay. and also at um, the Devil's Tower as yeah. well so do they, they do they mainly come out of like folklore and natural um local history um they're they're the indigenous people looked at those sites and said wow <laughs> this was the gods the gods were here and something miraculous happened and the story got woven into their culture and that's what they believe as the creation of that object and it's just it's beautiful it's, it really is a lovely thing. And so there's something called geomythology where it just talks about just that thing where the geology has played a part in the way people interpret their landscape. That, that's interesting, isn't it? It really is. I, I think about so in the, in the UK, it's quite interesting how all these stone circles have now, they've now sunk to the point they're barely above the surface. Now there's quite a few. Mm -hmm. I, I live, like I say, I live in Nottingham, and there's, there's two or three here. So in Derbyshire, just like a county over, there's they're everywhere. But they're now they've sunk so much because the ground's got wet over there for hundreds of years, and uh, I think maybe fifty years they'll all be gone. So will they ever be That's seen? Right. Again? Will they ever be seen? Map them now, preserve them now. That's it. Um, I'm trying to. Think. I'm sure I saw a documentary also that I think it was Siberia. They had these giant stone bowls they found that are. They have no idea what they are. They, they appear to be calf cupped into the ground and they're just screwing around. But uh, whether that was by natural um, geology or over uh, erosion, because um, there they were pictures were taken in the 1800s, but they're no longer there because they've sunk into the ground. Mm. It's fascinating stuff. There's so many places as well, like Karnak, as a place I've always wanted to go. Right, right. But again, there's an example, like we talked about the carcasses, where yeah. people are disconnected from nature. They don't understand how natural processes work. So they seem amazing, but they actually do have a natural explanation to to many of these these sites, and 
that's that's what I would like to get people who are interested in the weirdness. Uh, then stay for the scientific explanation. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it just made me think about people who collect rocks and stones and fascinating trinkets and quartz and crystals and stuff. Uh, they claim that they have some kind of interesting properties and they vibrate. Oh and... yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then they say that uh, certain places that have uh, profound experts. So we talk about um, Devil's Tower, for instance. It might have quartz under the ground or something. I don't quite know why it would, but I would use that and go. Well, there's lots of. Um, you know, amethyst here that's clearly right. a reason or something that would yeah. associate the fact that there's there's lots of mineral deposits there and that's a reason why it's spooky or or something or it attracts strangeness happening there do you find that as well oh my gosh that's everywhere I'm, I'm just reading a book about mysterious places and it's all about how he this person describing the places had to have his magnetometer with him and taking magnetic readings and there were weird magnetic readings around there there's a number of reasons why that could be, but he associated that with the strange place that people put that thing there, that structure there for a specific purpose because there was a geomagnetic anomaly there that affected them, made them feel sad, happy, spiritual, whatever. Um, we have a tendency to want to weave these threads together. And uh, I think that if you portray them in a certain way, it sounds sciencey and it sounds to the layperson uh, quite impressive. Yeah, very sad. And it's often a lot of, you know, BS thrown in there to make it, you know, sound better than it is. Yes, yeah, a lot of a lot of woo woo going on. A lot of woo woo. Very much, yeah. So Sharon, shall we shall we draw ourselves to a close now? And uh I promise to uh, meet you up and catch up in the future. I've certainly got some stuff to send over to you in that regard though, because uh, uh mysterious um England and Wales, I definitely want to send over to you and I'm sure I can find that paper as well. I think you'll find it really interesting. But yeah, that was also fantastic that we've uh, managed to catch up on this conversation. I've really enjoyed it tonight. And, Me too. Uh, yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. And yes. these things must happen more often. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I'm just, I feel quite um, disappointed in myself that I wasn't better prepared because I just <laughs> ran, ran over here. So I am so sorry that I didn't have one of my notes sorted. But, uh, but you know, I think we've had a fun conversation that allowed us to yeah. express this. So uh, look, have a nice night and I'll speak to you in the set very soon. Thank you very much for taking the time out to join me here today, I really do appreciate it. But if I could just ask one more thing of you, you could just press like, dislike, leave a comment, or press subscribe. You could do any on all of those things, but it allows me to know whether I'm producing the kind of content that you want to listen to. I do produce a variety of content, especially on YouTube and out into the world of social media. So please, if you would, thank you very much. I'm Christian Lander, until next time.